This is the combined chapters of chapter 19, 20, and 21. Integrated circuits, ICs, and digital circuits, and finally oscillators. To begin with chapter 19, integrated circuits. Objectives of this chapter are to define integrated circuits or ICs, give a brief history of the IC, discuss the construction of an IC, illustrate the steps in construction of an IC, explain the operation of the operational amplifier, and finally to explain the operation of the 555 timer. Some of the keywords encountered in this chapter are analog, as stable, chip, circuit designer, comparator, diffusion, digital, epic stacial or epic textual, 555 timer, integrated circuit or IC, layout designer, linear mono stable, offset null, operational amplifier or op amp, photo engraving, photo mask, photo resist, seed and substrate. An integrated circuit or IC is a complete electronic circuit contained in one package, see figure 19-1. This package often includes transistors, diodes, resistors, and capacitors along with the connecting and wiring and terminals. An IC is also called a chip. As discussed in chapter 18, the transistor was invented in 1947 by Breton, Bardeen, and Shockley of Bell Laboratories. The transistor served the same purpose as Lee DeForest's triode amplifier, but it did not need heat to operate. In addition, the transistor was solid, solid state, and much smaller. Transistors were first used in small appliances such as hearing aids and small transistor radios. Small size and efficient operation also made transistors useful in defense items. Transistors were also used in the newly developed electronic computer circuits of the 1950s and early 1960s. Computers used thousands of switching circuits and transistors were able to quickly perform this switching function. But as computer circuits became larger and more powerful, electronic circuits needed to become smaller because the components of circuits have to be wired together. Producing the smaller circuits was a complex task Printed circuit boards helped, but wiring was still bulky. This problem was solved by integrating all these components into a solid piece of material, the integrated circuit. The history of the integrated circuit. In 1952, GWA Dummer of the Royal Radar Establishment in Great Britain had the idea of an integrated circuit. However, his ideas were not put to use at all at that time. In 1957, a new process for planar transistor was developed at Fairchild Semiconductors. This allowed semiconductor emitters, bases, and other parts to be made from on the surface of a silicon wafer. In early 1958, Jack Kilby of the Texas Instrument Corporation was developing micro modules. These were to be made by printing the components on a ceramic wafer. He realized that semiconductors and other components could be made on the same surface through a manufacturing process. The first commercially produced integrated circuit resulted from his work or from this work. It was made on a thin wafer of germanium. However, it still had wire connections which caused a major problem or major problem when the wiring when wiring together large numbers of transistors and other conductors about the same time another process for making ICs was being studied at Fairchild semiconductors using the principles of planar transistor manufacturing Robert Noyce 
use the silicon dioxide dopants to protect and insulate PN junctions. The integrated circuit dramatically changed the electronics field. In 1965, about 30 components could be put in a silicon chip, 5 millimeters or 3 sixteenths of an inch square. By 1982, that number had increased to 100 or 1 million. Figure 19-3 shows this. While the IC or integrated circuit has become smaller and smaller, even reaching microscopic sizes, the principles of operation remain the same. Just to go over some of the questions, review questions for 19.1. What is an integrated circuit? It is, it is a complete circuit of with transistors, capacitors, resistors, etc. in one package. Who invented the transistor or the IC? That was GWA Dummer and Jack Kilby. And another question is list three advantages and disadvantages of ICs when compared with transistors. Nineteen point two IC construction. An integrated circuit consists of many extremely thin layers of P and N type material arranged in configurations such as transistors, diodes and resistors and capacitors. A single chip may contain a million of transistors and occupy less than one square inch in area. The circuit designer begins the production process by designing the complete integrated circuit. One factor affecting design is the intended use of the IC. With this in mind, the designer plans the best IC for use. He or she submits the completed design in the form of a schematic diagram. From this schematic diagram, the layout designer creates a, creates a detailed technical drawing. The circuit is drawn in a much larger scale than the final product so that when the drawing is reduced, where there will be enough space between parts. If any of the lines touch each other, the circuit will short out when tested. Next, each circuit layout is photographically reduced. It is not unusual for the layout to be reduced over 1000 times or more. A reduced layout allows for thousands of circuits to be put on a wafer. Working plates are made from the reduced layouts. These plates are called photo masks. Each photo mask goes with a certain step in the production process. Each mask contains a large number of identical actual sized parts. The photo masks are now ready for use and production of the IC and, can, and the IC production can now begin. The structure of an IC is a pure silicon crystal. These pure silicon crystals must first be produced. To make the crystal liquid silicon is purified, a silicon particle or seed is dipped into the melted silicon. It is slowly withdrawn and placed into a cool area. See figure 19-5 on the screen. The grown crystal is sliced off or sliced into wafers about 0.5 millimeters thick. The wafers are then polished to rid the wafer of surface scratches and contaminants. Small portions of impurities are then added. The impurities give the silicon its electrical traits. On the thin wafers of doped silicon, the basic building process begins. The circuit is built layer by layer on the silicon wafer or substrate. Each layer receives a pattern from the photo mask. In the example shown in figure 19-6 on the screen top, 
The first layer on top of the silicon is a layer of n-type material. It is grown right on the wafer and it is called the epitaxial or the epitaxial layer. Epictasy is a growth of one crystal on the surface of another crystal. This is the collector or for the transistor or a an element of an of a diode. Again, this is the collector for a transistor or an element of a diode. Next, a thin coat of silicon dioxide is grown over the n-type material by exposing the wafer to an oxygen atmosphere at about 1000 degrees Celsius. Let's see figure 19-7 on the bottom. Next, a thin coat of light sensitive emulsion is placed over the n-type layer. The emulsion is called photoresist. In a process called photoengraving, the photo mask is placed over the n-type layer. Then the entire wafer is exposed to ultraviolet light. Figure 19-8. The light causes the image of the photo mask to transfer to the wafer. The exposed photoresist hardens. The areas covered by the mask remain soft. Acids or solvents are used to etch away the unexposed or soft area of the photoresist. The leaves this leaves the layer of the n-type silicon exposed, figure 19-9. The exposed n-type layer is further etched away by the very hot gases. A chemical washes away any remaining hardened photoresist to expose all n-type silicon dioxide. As parts of the IC are constructed, they must be isolated from each other. This is done by diffusion. Diffusion is a process in which impurities are doped into the silicon wafer to form the needed junctions. Diffusion forms islands of n-type materials backing p-type materials. The wafer is diffused using boron. The boron cuts into and forms a p-type material on all areas not protected by the silicon dioxide. The wafer has isolated islands of n-type material, see figure 19-10, top of the screen. N-P junctions form around each, each island. There are back-to-back -back diodes between each n-type island. During diffusion, a new layer of silicon dioxide forms over the diffused P-type areas, as well as on top of the islands, see figure 19-11, bottom of the screen. The wafer is again coated with photoresist and exposed under a photo mask. Areas in the n-type islands are etched away. Once again, the wafer is subjected to a p-type diffusant that forms areas for transistor-based regions, resistors, or elements of diodes or capacitors. The wafer is then reoxidized. See figure 19-12. The wafer is again masked and exposed to open windows in the p-type regions. A phosphorus diffusant is used to produce n-type regions for diodes and capacitors. Small windows are also etched, etched through the n-type layer for electrical connections, see figure 19-13. The total wafer is again given an oxide coating. The monolithic circuit or the monolithic circuit is now complete except for the aluminum interconnections. The aluminum interconnections join the islands. They also join the circuit to other circuits and other devices. A thin coat of aluminum is vacuum deposited over the entire circuit. The aluminum coating is then sensitized and exposed through another special mask. After etching, only the interconnecting aluminum remains. It forms a pattern between transistors, diodes, and resistors. See figure 19-14, top. 
The inner connections of an IC can be made from a metal or alloy. Currently gold plated leads are recommended for use only with socket type IC devices. Gold creates a brittle joint when used in a solder type connection. This results in a damaged connection when the board is subjected to excessive vibration or board flexing. The completed circuits are then tested, see figure 19-15. In a single test, the circuits are used to perform a series of electrical tasks, figure 19-16. After testing, the wafers are separated into individual chips. Usually by scri scribing them with a diamond tip tool, the chips are then mounted onto a small can or flat package, figure 19-17. Leads are bonded and the ICs are washed. The cavities that hold the ICs are sealed and finally the ICs are shipped to a distributor. Resistors. The process just discussed is used to make semiconductor materials or ICs. This process can be used to make resistors, capacitors, and diodes. Recall that N-type and P-type materials have certain resistances. Resistance depends on the physical size of the material, length, or surface area, and the amount of dopants in the material. Semiconductors are made with very pure silicon. Through the doping process, impure trivalents or pentavalent atoms are added to produce the n-type or p-type substrate material. For example, a p-type silicon material is used as a as the substrate and or an n-type material is diffused into the surface of the chip figure 19-18. And then another p-type material is added to the n-type material. Metal leads are fastened to the end of this p-type material. The p-type material and its two connections are used as a resistor. Capacitors. Like resistors, capacitors can be made in an integrated circuit because for these or, or values for these capacitors are very small. Again, values for these capacitors are very small. However, they are still able to perform functions of coupling and storage. Figure 19-19 shows a capacitor, how a capacitor can be made in an integrated circuit. Putting it together. An example of how a transistor and capacitor can be integrated into one circuit is shown in figure 19-20. Keep in mind that thousands of these circuits can be placed onto an area the size of the head of a pin. Common types of ICs. Integrated circuits come in two basic types. The type depends on their linear function. These types are linear and digital. Linear ICs have variable outputs controlled by variable inputs. These ICs are also called analog devices or circuits. Linear ICs are used as components in linear amplifiers, operational amplifiers, voltage regulators, buffers, voltage comparators, analog switches, and audio amplifier circuits. Digital integrated circuits are used as switches. Their output operates on either on or off conditions. They are found in many logic and gate circuits in computers, and these will be discussed in depth in Chapter 20. Several IC designs, including pin, numbering systems, and dimensions are shown in Figure 19-21. Now the review questions for Section 19.2. 1. What is the purpose of the photo mask? It is to reduce the large IC layouts and size for IC production. 2. The silicon wafer on which an IC's IC is built layer by layer is called the photo engraving process. 3. A light sensitive emulsion that accepts the transferred image of the photo mask is called the answer is C. Photoresist. 
for what is diffusion it is isolating parts of an IC five what is the purpose of aluminum interconnections it is the conductor material between IC components question six what is or name the two common types of IC and some common types of ICs are the CPGA the SDIP again the CPGA is the ceramic through hole package the SDIP is the plastic through hole package the HDIP is the plastic through hole package with higher heat dissipation rates the PLCC is, is the plastic leaded chip barrier the QFP is the quad flat package the HSOP is the plastic dual construction surface mount package with higher heat dissipation rate the SO is the plastic dual construction surface mount package the TSOP is a thin small outline package VGA is the plastic array construction surface mount package and the HBGA is the plastic array construction surface mount package with higher heat dissipation rate other IC types are the package 19 8 lead to 3 metal can K package 4 4 14 lead flat package or F and package 6a 12 lead to 8 metal can G it is the H excuse me the a H 2114 slash slash H 8 a H 2114 C only And these can be found in pages 314 and 316 of your text. Nineteen point three operational amplifier, the op amp. One of the most commonly used integrated circuit chips today is the operational amplifier. The operational amplifier is often simply called the op amp. The 741 op amp is a near perfect amplifier. It has a high it has a high input impedance and a low output impedance, which makes it an excellent amplifier. The op amp has a wide frequency response. This means the frequency of the signal being amplified has little effect. On the operation of the amplifier as compared to other amplifiers it has a, a high gain capability and can be adjusted for zero offset voltage having a zero offset voltage means it has features that allow the amplifier output to be adjusted to absolute zero voltage many amplifiers have a slight output voltage due to temperature changes of the components the op amp can be corrected easily to compensate for temperature changes. The 741 op amp is a general purpose amplifier. It can be used to regulate power supplies made into a simple signal generator used as an oscillator, used as a radio or TV receiver, used as a timer or used as a filter. It also it is also used extensively for instrumentation, metering, current or voltage. Originally, the term operation amplifier applied to any complete circuit designed for many discrete components that resulted in a high gain, high performance amplifier. It was only natural that an amplifier used to use so extensively be designed as a single chip. There are over 20 transistors in an op amp chip, along with all of the trans resistors needed for bias. Using the op amp IC saves time and money and also makes repair troubleshooting much simpler. Op amps need only a few exterior components such as resistors and capacitors to create an amplifier of or one of the many other devices. In figure 19-22 it is illustrated the pin configuration of a typical 741 general purpose op amp 
Like most IC chips, the op-amp does not have a pin identification marking on the chip. The pins are identified by using specification sheets and a reference point. The reference point for our chip is the notch at the top. The pins are numbered in a counterclockwise direction starting at the notch. The power for the op-amp is provided through pins 4 and 7. The pin 7 is either connected to ground or a negative voltage value from 3 to 18 volts. Pin 7 is connected to the positive voltage of the power supply. The output of the amplifier is pin 6. There are two input pins, pin 2 and pin 3. Pin 2 is the inverting input. Any signal applied to pin 2 generates a signal of opposite polarity at the output. The non-inverting input, pin 3, generates an output at pin 6 of the same polarity. See figure 19-23. Take special notes that both inputs, pin 2 and pin 3, generate an output at pin 6, but they generate opposite polarities, the offset null. The offset null is a calibration feature of the op-amp. The op-amp is so sensitive to input voltage that at times the output will generate a signal even when there is no intentional input. To avoid this condition, for certain, for certain applications, offset null pins, pin 1 and pin 5, are provided. They are usually connected to a variable resistance, such as a potentiometer. The potentiometer can be adjusted to produce a zero output voltage from pin 6. Look at pin 8 and take note of the NC identification. This pin is not used. The NC stands for no connection. The op amp gain. The op amp gain or op amp gain is easily determined by the relationship of the feedback resistor and the input resistor. Look at figure 19 24 on the screen now. The feedback resistor is labeled. RF and the input resistor is labeled RI. To calculate the gain for the inverting op amp in figure 19-24 we simply divide the feedback resistor value RF or 100 K ohms by the input resistor value R1 10 K ohms. The gain AV for the op amp is 10. For a non-inverting op amp, the gain is equal to the feedback resistor value divided by the input resistor value plus 1. Again, for a non-inverting op amp, the gain is equal to the feedback resistor value divided by the input resistor value plus 1. The gain in the op amp circuit shown would be 11. So in the form of an equation, it would be AV or which is inverting equals to R F divided R1 or AV non-inverting equals to R F divided R1 that is in parentheses plus 1 And there is a project 19-1 in this chapter, building a voice recorder. You can follow along the several steps necessary to build this fun and exciting and interesting and curious project. I'll leave it up to you to go through the steps to perform it.
again these are on the text or the PDF files available through the link included in this video project 19-2 is the next project building an audio amplifier and here are the steps and uh, schematic as well as parts needed comparator circuit Another mode of operation of the op amp is as in comparator circuits. The operating when operating as a comparator, both bo both inverting and non-inverting inputs are used. As the name comparator implies, the two inputs are compared to each other. The output of the comparator is driven to maximum positive or negative, depending on which input is more dominant. Look at figure 19-25 on the screen now. The comparator circuit, circuit is designed as a motor control system. It brings a DC motor up to running RPM and then maintains it. The input is wired to a pot potentiometer while the other is connected to a small generator on the DC motor shaft. As the motor turns, a DC voltage is generated. The, op the op amp will continue to put outs an inverted signal until the two inputs have a matching voltage amp amplitude. When the motor RPM is generating a slightly higher EMF than the other input, the op amp switches to maximum opposite polarity. The op amp changes output condition to match the input conditions. This output switching occurs so rapidly that it maintains motor RPM under changing mechanical load conditions. Op amps come in various forms. There can be more than one op amp constructed on a single chip that takes the place of a multi-stage amplifier. They can be constructed from standard bipolar transistor construction or from MOSFET or JFET systems. The construction of an op amp is determined by the electrical characteristics desired. Moving on to the review questions for section 19.3. 1. What is the difference between the inverting and non inverting op amp output signals? The non inverting, for the non inverting, the AC output signal phase is the same as the output. For the inverting, the output is 180 degrees out of phase. Question 2. What is the gain inverting for the up amp below? And we use the formula given, which is RF divided RI, in this case 22k ohms divided 1k ohm, and is equal to, in this case, 20k ohm. So the gain would be 20k ohms. Question 3. What does the offset null on the op amp do? It prevents unwanted outputs. Question 4. Power for energizing the op amp is connected to which two points? Or which two pins? Again, power for energizing the op amp is connected to which two pins that is pin 4 and 7 question 5 which pin is used to input a signal when you desire the output polarity to match the input polarity in this case pin 3 generates an output to pin 6 again pin 3 generates an output to pin 6 of the same polarity The 555 timer. The 555 timer is another of the most popular integrated circuits in the industry today. It is very accurate and its construction is simple. Look at figure 19 26. The 555 timer 
can be used for highly accurate timing circuits with a range from a few microseconds to hours. Using more than one 555 timer, we can construct a timing device that will run for years. Other applications include sequencing operations for control systems, time delay operations, and repetitive pulses. The 555 IC becomes a timer with, with the simple addition of one resistor and one capacitor. The two main modes of operation of the 555 timer are referred to as the mono-stable or and the as-stable. Again, the two main modes of operation of the 555 timer are referred to as mono-stable and as-stable. When operating in mono-stable mode, the timer generates an output once for a predetermined period of time. This is also referred to as one-shot operational mode. In the as-stable mode, the timer puts out a repetitive signal from the output pin. The output in both cases is usually a square wave signal. See figure 19-27. The top of the pulse wave is referred to as a high signal and the bottom of the pulse is referred to as a low signal. The width of the pulse and the distance between the pulses can be controlled by resistor and capacitor values that are connected to the chip. Pin 1 is connected to the ground and pin 8 is connected to a positive voltage. The number 2 pin is called the trigger. The trigger starts the timing process. The output of the 555 timer is located at pin 3. The timing of the output pulses is determined by the value of resistors and capacitors connected to pins 7 and 6. The reset pin 4 can be or can override the operation of the timer. When activated, the reset will return the timer will return the timing operation back to the beginning of the timing cycle. Review questions for section 19.4. Which two pins are used to power the 555 chip? That is pins 1 and 8. Question 2. How are the timing cycles determined for the 555 timer? That is by resistor and capacitor values. 3. The output timing signal is located at which pin? That is pin 3. And finally, the summary for the chapter. An integrated circuit, or IC, is a complete electronic circuit in a small package. It contains many transistors, diodes, resistors, and capacitors. ICs are also called chips. Advantages of the, RC, of the ICs are its low cost, high component density, high switching speed, low power consumption, and small size. Some disadvantages are that only certain parts are, can be built into an IC and it is limited by the voltage and current capacity. The IC production process is a detailed involved one in which one circuit is built on another circuit. ICs come in many styles and sizes. The two basic types of ICs are linear and digital. The operational amplifier or op, or op amp is a common linear IC amplifier. It has a high gain capability and can be used or can be adjusted for zero offset voltage. The gain in an app in an op amp circuit can be calculated using the equations shown at the bottom where A V inverting equals to RF divided R1 or AV non-inverting equals to RF divided R1 and all of uh, both of those the product of that division plus 1. Finally the 555 is a common linear 
IC timer. Moving on to test your knowledge for this chapter. Question one, an IC is all of the above, which includes is a complete electronic circuit, often contains transistors, diodes, resistors, and capacitors, and it is also called a chip. Question two, fill in the blank. The circuit designer, that is the answer, begins the IC production process by illustrating the complete IC. Question three, why is the initial drawing of an IC done on such a large scale? And the answer is for later reduction to facilitate uh, the design. Question four, why are silicon wafers polished? And that is to remove imperfections on their surface. Fill in the blank. Epitaxial is the growth of one crystal on the surface of another crystal. Question six, during photo engraving, the covered areas remain covered by the N-type silicone. That is the answer. Question seven, label the layers in the following sketch. And those are labeled on the screen. First one, A is mask, B is the photoresist, the C is the N-type material, and finally D, the P-type material. Question eight, during diffusion, blank are added to the silicon wafer to form needed junctions, and that is impurities. During diffusion, impurities are added to the silicon wafer to form the needed junctions. Question nine, why are completed ICs tested? And that is for accuracy of operation. 10, linear ICs are also called analog devices. The answer is analog. 11, last question is digital integrated circuits are used as fill in the blank switches. Moving on to chapter 20, digital circuits. Some of the objectives for the chapter include to explain the difference between analog and digital systems, convert decimal numbers to their binary equivalents and binary numbers to their decimal equivalents, to name seven types of logic gates, explain the operation of various types of logic gates, use truth tables to determine the output of a logic gate, discuss two types of logic families, explain the digital encoders and decoders, explain analog to digital and digital to analog devices, and list three types of flip-flops and explain their truth tables. Keywords and terms, the following words are terms that will become important pieces of your electricity and electronics vocabulary. Look for them as you read this chapter. The terms are AND, gate, binary, bit, byte, complementary metal oxide semiconductor logic or CMOS, counter, decimal system, decoder, encoder, flip-flop, inverter, logic gate, NAND gate, NOR gate, NOT gate, OR gate, transistor to transistor logic or TTL, truth table, XNOR gate and XOR gate. review an integrated circuit or IC it is a complete electronic circuit contained in one package usually this package includes transistors diodes resistors and capacitors along with the connecting wiring and terminals a major advantage of the IC is its size high capacity computers all fit in the palm of a hand 
or easily into a briefcase and are made possible by small size ICs. ICs are also very stable compared to individual components and they are less costly to build and operate. Figure 20-1 shows an enlarged IC or millions of components make up this IC. This IC is used in computers as discussed in chapter 19, there are two types of integrated circuits, linear and digital. Linear circuits are used as amplifiers and have variable outputs. Digital ICs are used as switches. They work in either, in either the on or off state. Digital electronics have many uses in our lives. Digital electronics are used in communication systems such as television, radio, CD players, telephone systems, satellite systems, clocks, watches, fiber optics, communications, calculators, computers, electronic meters, and much more. Digital systems are ideal for stepping motor drives, which make the digital electronic systems ideal for use in robot <clears throat> robotics. The MP3 player in figure 20-2 relies on digital electronics for its remarkable playback feature. Figure 20-3 shows a small camcorder that records and displays both visual and audio information based on digital electronics. Digital electronics is a vast field of study. It is the basis of the modern computer system. Using digital and combined with analog systems, anything in the mind can conceive can be creative. Again, anything that the mind can conceive can be created using digital electronics and analog. 20-1 Digital Fundamentals There are two major fields of electronics, analog and digital. Analog is a system of continuous change without interruption. An example of an analog system would be a potentiometer used to control the intensity of an LED. As the potentiometer is rotated clockwise and counterclockwise, the LED will gradually brighten and then dim. On the other hand, a digital system is either on or off. A good example of a digital system is a single pole switch. It will instantaneously bring the lamp to a full brightness or darkness. At first it may seem that the analog system is better than the digital, but in fact both systems have their own advantages. Analog, digital or both systems may be used for different applications. Below is a list of some of the major advan advantages of digital systems. Digital ICs are inexpensive as, as compared to similar analog systems. Information is much easier to store in digital systems. Digital systems are usually faster than analog systems. Digital systems are compatible with computer systems. Temperature has less effect on digital systems, which results in a much more stable operation than analog systems. Through the use of very special integrated circuits, digital circuits are capable of replicating analog systems that will completely fool the human senses. A lamp dimmer constructed using special digital techniques would be indistinguishable from an analog system. Digital telephone technology can make it impossible for most people to tell if digital or analog electronic techniques are used for transmitting a conversation. Digital Integrated circuits handle information using switching circuits. They work as a result of the use of a combination of logic gate and flip-flop circuits. Let's look at gates and their operation using a system known as the binary logic. Binary numbering system. Digital electronic circuits can be made to act in two states, on and off. This two-state system is called binary. This system can be compared to a single pole, single throw, or SPST switch. 
figure 20-4 shows this a switch in the opposite off position represents a zero in the binary numbering system likewise a switch in the on position represents a one it is not practical to build large electronic logic circuits using using manual switches manual switches do however provide a good basis for understanding other switchable electronic components figure 20-5 The transistor is the most common electronic component that can be used as a switch. The transistor allow current to flow, or the transistor can allow, allow current to flow. This is an on or one state, or it can stop current from flowing. This is the off or zero state. See figure 26. Chapter 18, Class B amplifiers were discussed in that chapter. These amplifiers are biased at the midpoint of the curve produced by the emitter voltage and collector current. Without any input signal, point A to B in figure 20-6, the amplifiers are turned off. If the input signal changes to a negative level, B or C, the emitter to base bias will be decreased. This condition causes the output signal across the lamp to swing, to swing positive. Input signal is 180 degrees out of phase with output signal in a CE circuit. With only one SPST switch we can produce only two outputs, 0 and 1. With additional switches, we can count higher. To understand how to count to a higher number, such as 45 or 79, with switches that are either on or off, we must learn the binary system. There is a basic rule for counting in any system. Digits must be recorded one after the other for each counting unit. This continues until the count exceeds the total number of digits available. Then a second column is started and counting continues. In the number system you're accustomed to the decimal system there are 10 digits available. Each time the count is raised from 0 you place the next higher digit 0, 1, 2, 3 all the way through 9. This takes you from 0 through 9. 9 is the last digit available in the decimal system. Thus it is time to start a second column and continue 10, 11, 12. The binary system works as shown in figure 20-7. Since only two digits are available in the binary system, when you reach two, you must start a new column. The digit zero in the decimal system is zero in the binary system. Likewise, the digit one in the decimal system is one in the binary system. However, the number two in the decimal system is the number 10 in the binary system. There is no digit 2 in binary, so you have to move into the second column to create the number 2. The binary number for 6 is 110. See figure 8 for this top of the screen. In figure 20-9, shows the decimal to binary conversion for, for the numbers 0 through 26. Try to extend this table to 50. If you have trouble with binary numbers, try this activity. 
It may help you understand the binary numbering system or concept. Tear off five small pieces of tape. Number the tape as shown in figure 20-10. Place one piece of tape on each finger of your left hand with palm up in the order shown. Fingers pointing up represent ones. The fingers folded down represent zeros. Position your hand as shown in figure 20-11. What is the binary number? And what is its decimal equivalent? A larger decimal number, 79, is shown in binary form in figure 20-12. Top of the screen. Again, the decimal number shown is 79 in binary form. Binary addition is a simple process. Figure 20-13 shows that. When adding 0 and 0, the sum is still 0. When adding 1 and 0, the sum is 1. But when adding 1 and 1, it produces the sum 10 or 1 and 0. The zero is placed in the ones column and the one is carried up to the twos column to be added with the uh, other did the other digits. To add two larger binary numbers, the same steps are followed. Figure twenty fourteen shows the addition of fifty seven which is 0011001 and 24 which is 00011000 figure 20-15 is a chart for comparison of some common electronic numbering systems Voltage logic levels in digital circuits. We know that digital circuits have only two states of 1 and 0, or 0 and 1. The operating voltages needed in a circuit for these two values depend on the type of logic circuitry or family used. Regardless of the logic family used in position in positive logic, the high value is of 1 is called the lo valid logic high range. Again, regardless of the logic family used in positive logic, the high value of 1 is called the valid logic high range. The value or this value of most often varies from 2 to 3.5 volts to 5 volts. The low value or 0 varies from 0 to 0.8 to 1.5 volts. This value is shown as the zero or V1 range in figure 20-16. This is called the valid logic low. The area between these two values acts as a buffer range. Any voltage in this range applied to the digital circuit causes confusion in the IC. The IC will not know whether to produce a 0 or a 1. This area is called the invalid value range or the intermediate range. In figure 20-16 this range is shown between V1 and V2. Bits, nibbles and bytes. In binary code, the smallest unit of information is called a bit. The word bit comes from joining the two words, binary and digit. 
a bit can either be 0 or 1. It is only one column or digit in a binary numbering system. Figure 20-17 shows this. Four bits of information make up a nibble. Two nibbles or eight bits make up a byte. A byte is a single unit of memory in a computer. For example, a computer with 256 byte storage can hold 2048 bits of information. This is a small number, however, most computer memory is given using the terms kilobytes, megabytes, or gigabytes. Computer storage abilities continue to grow. Some of the terms associated with computer memory have symbols and numeric values assigned to them. For example, kilobyte symbol is a K, capital K, and the numeric value of that is 1000. A megabyte symbol is, uh, is a capital M. The number value is 1 million. A gigabyte, capital G, and it's a billion. A terabyte. The number, uh, the symbol is capital T, and it's a trillion. Review questions for section 20.1. Question one describe how a transistor biased as class B amplifier can act as a switch. Class B amplifiers were discussed in chapter 18. These amplifiers are biased at the midpoint of the curve produced by the emitter voltage and collector current. So without any input signal from point A to point, to point B in figure 20-16 of your text, going back to the diagrams to the figures the amplifiers are turned off if the input signal changes to a negative level B to C the emitter to base bias will be decreased this condition causes the output signal across the switch to swing positive the input signal is 180 degrees out of phase with the output signal in the CE circuit. Question three: What is the decimal number for one zero zero? Excuse me, one zero one one zero one, and that is forty-five. Question four: What is the binary sum of zero one zero zero one zero one zero and zero one zero one one zero zero one the answer for that is given on the lower right of the screen which is 115 and what is the decimal equivalent of the sum I just gave you the decimal equivalent but the decimal of the uh, binary answer it's also given at the bottom left of the bottom right of the screen, which is zero one 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 zero zero one one. Question five a byte consists of two nibbles is the answer. Question number six a logic value high is represented by the number one, while the low logic level is represented by the number zero. Question seven, between the valid high and the valid low logic value is the invalid val value range or the intermediate range, which does not produce a valid high or low. Logic gates. Electronic switching circuits that govern or decide whether inputs 
will pass or to output or be stopped are called logic gates. Ele again, electronic switching circuits that govern or decide whether inputs will pass or to output or be stopped are called logic gates. The logic gates discussed here are the building blocks for other logic gates. The basic logic gates are AND gate, OR gate, NOT gate, NAND gate, NOR gate, the XOR gates, and the XNOR gates. All logic gates can be made from some combination of the first three gates in the list, highlighted in pink, the AND, OR, or NOT gates. The AND gate. The AND gate accepts high and low inputs, that's 1 and 0. Based on these inputs, the gate decides on the output. The outputs of an AND gate are also high or low. The AND gate symbol is shown in figure 20-18. The AND gate produces an output of 1 high if all inputs are 1 or high. The logic 1 or high also equals on. A simple circuit which with switches, again a simple sync circuit with switches that functions like an AND gate is shown in figure 20-19. Both switches are off, 0 or low. The lamp does not burn. When both switches are on, the lamp burns, figure 20-20. If only one or the other gate is on, the lamp does not burn. This simple circuit using SPSTs, that's single pole, single throw switches, illustrates an, an AND gate operation. However, the actual AND gate used is a computer in a computer is very complex. A binary table that explains the operation of the AND gate is shown in figure 20-21. This table is called the truth table. The truth table shows the inputs on the left and outputs on the right. The AND gate is used to detect the presence of high signals or ones or on both inputs A and B. Again, the AND gate is used to detect the presence of high signals or ones on both inputs A and B. If this occurs, out, the output signal will be 1. However, if even one input signal is 0, the output will be 0. The output signal, as affected by input signals, in the AND gate is shown in figure 20-22. OR gates. The OR gate provides an output signal of 1 high when either one of its inputs or both of them is 1. If all inputs are 0 in an OR gate, the output is a zero or low. The OR gate circuit detects the presence of any high input. The symbol for an OR gate is shown in figure 20-23. The truth table for an OR gate is shown in figure 20-24. The schematic for an OR gate is created from switches and is shown in figure 20-25. The OR gate acts like a like two switches in parallel. The output signal, as it is affected by input signals in the OR gate, is shown in figure 20-26. The NOT gates. The NOT gate is put into a circuit to invert the polar or the polarity of the input signal. The NOT gate is often called an inverter because the name describes its, fun its function. 
If the input signal is 1, the output signal will be 0. Likewise, if the input signal is 0, the output will be 1. The symbol for the NOT gate is shown in figure 20-27. Note that the NOT gate symbol has only one input lead. Notice that there is also a small circle at the end of the triangle in the symbol. The schematic for a simulated NOT gate circuit is shown in figure 20-28. The NOT gate truth table is shown in figure 20-29. Figure 20-30 shows the output signal in a NOT gate as affected by the input signals. NAND gates or negative AND gates. All logics are combinations of the basic gates AND, OR, or NOT. The NAND gate is a negative AND gate. It is made up of an AND gate and a NOT gate. It is also called a NOT AND gate. The NAND gate symbol is like the AND gate symbol both with a circle at the end. Figure 20-31 shows that. The schematic for a NAND gates circuit simulated for switch from switches is shown in figure 20-32. The NAND gate truth table is shown in figure 20-33. Notice that this truth table is the reverse of the AND truth table. Figure 20-34 shows the waveforms in a NAND gate circuit. The NOR gates or negative OR gate. The NOR gate gives the opposite or negative results of the OR gate. The NOR gate is made up of an OR gate and a NOT gate, the inverter. The symbol for a NOR gate is shown in figure 20-35. Figure 20-36 shows the schematic for a NOR circuit simulated with switches. The NOR circuit is used to test for any kind of input if there is no input, the output will be 1. If there is an input, output will be 0. This is shown in figure 20-37 in the truth table for the circuit. Notice that the truth table for the NOR gate is the exact opposite of the truth table for the OR gate. The waveforms of a NOR gate circuit are shown in figure 20-38. The XOR gates or the exclusive OR gate. There is a special type of gate that provides a high output whenever any but not all inputs are logic high. It is called the exclusive OR gate or XOR gate. Recall that in contrast the OR gate provides a high out output when, whenever any or all inputs are logic high. The symbol for the XOR gates is shown in figure 20-39. The circuit that simulates the XOR gates using two single pole double throw switches is shown in figure 20-40. The XOR gates truth table is shown in figure 20-41. 
The waveforms of a XOR gate circuit are shown in figure 20-42. The XNOR gates, or exclusive negative OR gate. A gate similar to the XOR gates is the exclusive NOR gate, or XNOR gate. This gate is the XOR gate with the output inverted. There is a high output only if all inputs are logic high or logic low. The symbol for the XNOR gate is shown in figure 20-43. The truth table for this circuit is shown in figure 20-44. Notice that if only one input is high, column A or column B, there is a zero in column C. If column A and column B both have zeros, or both have ones, then column C has a one. And now the review questions for section 20.2. One, draw the symbol for three logic gates and label the drawings. Those are an attempt that those are shown at the top for AND, OR, and NOT gates. Question two, in an AND gate, Input A is 1 and input B is 0. What is the output? And the output is 0 since the inputs are different. As long as the inputs are different in an AND gate, the output will always be 0. If the inputs are the same, then the output will be 1. Question 3. The OR gate will provide a high output signal, except when both inputs are zero is the answer that's answer number b not answer b question four the not gate is often called the inverter question five what gate provides an output when any but not all of the inputs are one and that is the xor gate Question C, 6. Draw the truth table for the XNOR gates. And that is drawn, or an attempt that that is at the bottom of the screen. Moving on to 20.3 Logic Families. Manufacturing techniques have a major impact on the arrangement of digital circuits into groups or families. It is crucial that the traits of one logic family match the traits of another family when a number of digital ICs or integrated circuits are used in one device. The device may operate on different voltages and timing can be affected. In the time that has passed in the digital electronics field, certain logic families have evolved. The CMOS logic. The complementary metal oxide semiconductor logic or CMOS family uses a field effect transistor. CMOS integrated circuits have good resistance to noise. They require only small amounts of power, voltage, and current needs are not crucial. CMOS ICs have one major problem, however, they can be damaged by static electricity. To prevent damage from static discharge, the worker and work surface should be grounded through a high resistance resistor, 3 to 10 mega ohms at 5 watts or more. CMOS ICs contain a manufacturer's identification number. One company uses a CD prefix, another firm uses a C within the number such as 74C30. High-speed CMOS devices contain a, an H in the identification number, such as 74HC00 or 74, 74HC190. 
CMOS ICs operate on voltages as high as 15 volts. Transistor, transistor logic. The transistor, transistor logic or TLL, excuse me, the TTL family is used widely in today's digital electronics. They work quickly. They perform logic functions from about 20 megahertz to 60 megahertz. The TTL ICs work faster than CMOS ICs. TTL ICs can be identified by their number. Their numbers begin with 74, 7400, 7402, 7404, etc. Unlike the CMOS logic, there is no C in the identification numbers for TTL logic. Logic highs for TTL or the logic high for TTL is 2 to 5 volts. Logic low is 0 to 0.8 volts. The TTL requires high power dissipation and high current. High power TTL ICs contain the part number 74H. They consume about twice the power of a regular TTL IC. Low power TTL ICs contain the part number 74L and consume one-tenth of the power of a regular TTL IC. A number of gates can be placed in one TTL IC. Figure 20-45 shows this and shows some TTL ICs containing AND gates, NOT gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, and XOR gates. Review questions for section 20.3. What two logic families are used widely today? That is the CMOS and the TTL. A 7408 IC is found to be a CMOS logic family. List the advantages and major disadvantages of the CMOS ICs. That is that they resist noise. They, are, they use small power. The volts or voltage and current needs aren't crucial. The major disadvantage of the CMOS is that it is, it is easily damaged by static electricity. Question 4. What type of resistor does CMOS IC use? And it uses a high resistance resistor. Excuse me, what type of transistor does the CMOS IC use? And it uses a high resistance transistor. Question 5. What number is used to signify a TTL IC? That is a 7400 series. Question 6. For most TTL logic systems, a low value is represented by a voltage of 0 to approximately 0.8 voltage volts, while a high value is represented by the voltage of approximately 2 to 5 volts. Question 7. A CMOS IC can operate on a voltage as high as 15 volts. Twenty point four digital applications. Digital circuits are used for many reasons. For example, digital circuits convert AC sine waves to digital pulses. Figure twenty forty six shows this. The AC signal is sampled. Various points are given digital values. These are later converted to a binary value. Digital disks have binary information recorded on their surface. A laser reads the information on the recording. Another example of digital electronics use is the Universal Product Code or UPC. It is found on most items purchased today. The UPC is read by a laser lights 
the laser improves inventory, item movement control. Some laser scanning systems contain a computer generated voice that tells the operator and the customer what has been purchased and the price of the item. A logic probe. The basic piece of test equipment used for digital circuits is the logic probe. The logic probe indicates either a high or low signal using LEDs. The logic probe connects to the power supply of the circuit being tested. The red, the red lead connects to the positive side of the power supply while the black negative lead connects to the ground. Most logic probes are equipped with a slide switch that allows to select the logic family you will be testing. TTL or CMOS are the logic families that you may be testing. The tip of the probe is touched to a pin on the chip or a connection point. The LED indicator lights to indicate a high or low logic value. When both LEDs lights there is either an invalid logic level, voltage or the probe is not making good contact with the circuit. The or each logic probe manufacturer uses a unique design. Therefore the instruction book of a logic probe should always be checked before use. Digital encoders and decoders. Most people have only learned the decimal number system. The digital system uses the binary numbering system, which is very different from the decimal system. To make the binary number system easily understandable to us, we use an electronic system to translate or decode the binary system into the decimal system. A device that makes this translation is called a decoder. An example of a decoder is the 7448 chip. This chip converts a binary code to its decimal number equivalent on an LED 7 segment, seven segment display. This instrument allows us to easily read the binary number as a decimal number. The conversion process also works in reverse. A decimal number can be converted to a binary number through an encoder. Once the decimal number has, has been encoded to a binary number, it can be utilized in a digital system such as a computer. There are also analog to di digital and digital to analog converters. These devices can change analog information such as temperature to a digital number equivalent. A digital multimeter is a good example of how analog information can be changed to digital information. When a voltage reading is taken from a circuit using a DMM, digital multimeter, the input to the meter is an analog signal. Inside the meter, the encoder changes the analog signal into a binary number or binary code. This code is then turned into the decimal number value that appears on the meter's display. Some circuits such as the 70, 7490 counter are designed to convert electrical pulses into binary numbers. The counter advances by one each time the input receives an electrical pulse. The counter can be connected to a decoder and an LED driver such as the 7448 to display the pulse count as a decimal number. See figure 20-50 for this. Digitized analog signals. 
a sound wave or linear voltage can be represented by a pattern of digital signals. There are many advantages of digit to digitizing a sound wave pattern. A sound, a sound wave can be converted into a digital pattern using an analog to digital encoder. Each voltage level is represented by a binary code. Figure 20-51 shows how the analog sound wave pattern might be represented by a series of binary numbers. The numbers can be transmitted by phone lines, satellites, microwave beams, beams, etc. Once the sound pattern is encoded as a binary pattern, it can be transmitted faster than the time used to actually produce the sound. At its final destination, the digital pattern can be converted to an analog signal again. The digital wave pattern will be in sharp steps and must be smoothed out. This smoothing of the digital pattern is accomplished using a filter similar to the filter used to power on a power supply. Once the pattern is smoothed out, it will be a perfect match of the original signal. The digitized pattern shown in figure 20-51 looks a bit crude because it is based on a 4-bit pattern. Notice the bit patterns at the bottom of the graphs. An actual digitized signal would use an 8, 16 or 32-bit encoder. The time increment between the binary codes would also be shortened. The combined effect of a larger bit pattern, say 32 bits, and a shorter time period between the binary code creates a digital pattern very close to the original analog pattern. Only a slight filtering action would be needed to smooth the digitized pattern to match the original analog sound pattern. The digitizing of sound has made it possible to store sound in computer memory. Once stored, it can be played back later or even manipulated to distort or enhance the sound. For example, an echo can be easily made from any original sound pattern or the volume and tone of the pattern can be changed. Flip-flops Flip-flops are rather unique digital devices based upon the operation of combined logic gates. Flip-flops are, are an essential part of digital electronics. They are at the very heart of counters, timers, sequencing devices, and memories. Flip-flops are semiconductor devices that are capable of assuming one of two stable states. Two common flip-flops are the RS and the JK varieties. The RS flip-flop Looking at figure 20-52, two NAND and two NOT gates have been configured to operate as a flip as in flip-flop. Two NOR gates have also been configured as a flip-flop. The standard pin markings are R, S, Q, Q with a dash on top. Q with a dash on top is pronounced Q NOT. This flip-flop configuration is called an SAT-RESAT flip-flop or an RS flip-flop. The S pin is called the SAT and the R pin is called the RESAT. The operation of an RS flip-flop is simple. When the S is high, the Q is also high. When the R is high, Q not is high. When both inputs are low, the output will represent the last input setting. Both inputs being high is not a valid value. The output cannot be determined if both inputs are high. In figure 20-52 again also shows a truth table of the RS, that's the reset the set reset flip-flop 
the basic principle behind the operation of a flip-flop is that the outputs are complementary. In other words, they, they help each other, they aid each other, they complement each other. To say that two outputs are complementary means that when one output is high, the other one is low. Flip-flops can either retain their output condition or flip-flops can retain their output condition. A clocked RS flip-flop uses a clock to synchronize the outputs. With a clocked RS flip-flop the output changes when there's a change in the R or S input and a pulse appears at the clock input. By using devices that are clock driven, millions of parts can work together in unison to form an entire digital system. A digital clock is a string of pulses that varies continuously from high to low. The pulse train is the heartbeat of, the, of most digital systems. The RS flip-flop retains its output status even after the input is removed. This makes, this makes the clocked RS flip-flop a good memory device. The JK flip-flop The JK flip-flop is operationally similar to the RS flip-flop. The JK flip-flop is, is clock driven like the clocked RS flip-flop. The difference is that the JK flip-flop will retain its output status when two lows are present at its inputs. Also when both inputs are high the outputs will off and on. For this see figure 20-54. The deep flip-flop. The deep flip-flop 20-55 is similar to the JK flip-flop except the deep flip-flop does not require two inputs and the JK does. When an input signal is received at the input, the Q outputs will toggle after a clock signal is applied. The output state of Q and Q0 will not change the state until the clock signal is received. By comparing the truth table of the RS, JK and the D flip-flops, you can see that the D flip-flop never has an unknown state. Unlike the RS and JK, the RS flip-flop has not allowed ha, has a not allowed state and the J and the JK flip-flop has an output state that cannot be determined unless the prior state of the flip-flop is known. The D flip-flop do, do not have these problems. The flip-flop output cues are always complementary. The JK flip-flop can be made to simulate a D flip-flop by placing a NOT gate between its inputs. Many flip-flops are used in binary counters. As you can see the RS clocked RS D flip-flop and the JK flip-flop all have at least one of the two outputs high. They switch between these two states. Q is either high or low. Since the binary number system is composed of only zeros and ones, you can see how the flip-flops might easily be used at, as the heart of a binary counting system. Counters. A counter 
is a device that counts, stores, and often displays the number of times an event occurs in a series. Events can be switches turning off and on, or voltages rising and falling. The events could be triggered by a pulse train or by some lever on an assembly line. The counter in figure 20-56 shows how a counter is fabricated from individual flip-flops. Counters are readily available as integrated chips. One such counter is the 74HC193. It is an integrated circuit composed of flip-flops. Not only will it count up, 1, 2, 3, but it will, it will also count down, 10, 9, 8. The counter also has a carry and borrow function. These principles are the basis of the common digital calculator. Decade counter. The decade counter is a common digital counter. The term decade refers to its ability to count based on 10 or decade. The decade counter can also be used to divide by 10. Because of this feature, it is often used as a frequency divider for oscilloscopes or in a digital clock. By connecting the three decade counters together, a 60 hertz source can be used to make a digital clock keep up time. Figure 20-57 shows this. The 60 hertz frequency is used to trigger a counter. Since the frequency is 60 hertz, the counter counts to 60 to equal one second. 60 cycles of 60 seconds would signal one minute. 60 minute cycles indicate one hour. Combine this with another counter that counts 24 or 12, a decoder driver and four seven segments, or a, and a four seven segment display, and you have constructed, constructed a timepiece. Moving on to the review questions for section 20.4. Number one, the logic probe is the basic piece of test equipment for testing logic circuits. I'm reading these questions as complete uh, sentences, even though they may they may be uh, fill in the blank questions. That way, you will know the complete statement without uh, fumbling around with a blank or fill in the blank statements with the question. It makes it a bit less confusing. Question two, a binary number can be converted to a decimal equivalent number using a decoder. A decoder is the answer. Question three, what is the main difference between a JK flip-flop and a D flip-flop? And the answer is that the D flip-flop never has an unknown state. Question four, what does the term complementary mean in reference to a flip-flop? And it means that a high output on R equals a high on Q naught, and a high on S equals a high on Q. Last question, number five. In reference to flip-flops, the label CLK represents the term clock or clocked. Moving on to the summary for the chapter. There are two types of integrated circuits, linear and digital. Digital circuits containing semiconductors use on, off, or high and low pulse levels to activate them. The binary numbering system has only two digits, zero and one. Digital logic circuits are on one in the valid logic high voltage area 
and off or zero in the val valid logic low voltage areas. Basic logic gate circuits include AND gate, OR gate, NOT gate, NAND gate, NOR gate, XOR gate, and XNOR gate. The symbols for them are drawn right next to each word or name. Digital ICs can perform all logic functions. The truth tables show the condition of a gate's output with varying input values. The two main logic families for ICs are the complementary metal oxide semiconductor or the CMOS and the transistor transistor logic or TTL. Analog to digital devices convert analog signals to digital signals. Digital to analog devices convert digital signals to analog signals. Flip flops have complementary outputs. Some common types of flip flops are the RS, JK, and D flip flops. Flip flops can be made into counters and memory devices. Moving on to the test your knowledge part of the chapter. These are a series of questions that challenge your uh, knowledge and your familiarity with the material just taught or read. Question number one, the two state system in which circuits are either on or off is the binary system. Question two, give the binary equivalents for decimal numbers one through ten and that is written down right by the number two at the bot bottom right, excuse me, bottom left of the screen. So you can see the binary system uh, is written from right to left as far as the numbers uh, order is concerned the columns as you can see column one column for the uh, ones values a column for the two values is on its left the column for the fourth values is on its left and the, finally the column for the eighth values is on its left and you can keep going by doubling each time you write another column like 16 32 64 etc Question three, complete the following binary addition problems. We have uh, four addition problems here from A through D, and those have been solved, and the answer has been written down and boxed. And you can see how to work those right there on the screen on the lower right. The addition for the binary numbers is quite easy. All you have to do is follow those three simple rules where 1 plus 1 is always equal to 0. 0 plus 0 equals 0 as well. Excuse me, 1 plus 1 going back to that equals 0, but you have to carry 1 to the next column on the, on the left. So it's actually 1 plus 1 equals 1, 0, which is the equivalent for 2. So you have to write one in the first column and carry, excuse me, write zero in the first column and carry a one towards the top of the other column. Like you can see there right below uh, where A is placed right there on the middle of the screen. 11, uh, 1101 plus 1001. The first addition on the right side of it 1 plus 1 equals the answer would be 1 z uh, yeah 1 0 but you can only put 1 0 I mean this you can only put the 0 on the under the 1 plus 1 and carry the 1 to the next column up top 
and then the next column instead of being 0 plus 0 is actually 1 plus 0 which in that case is 1 as you can see continuing on with the rules the three rules 1 plus 1 equals 1 and 0 carrying the 1 on the next column 0 plus 0 equals 0 always and then 0 plus 1 equals just simply 1 following those three rules you can solve all of these additions as you can see on the screen make sure you attempt to do those on your own and get some more practice if needed question four the valid logic high is the high value of one and the valid logic low is the low value of zero that was a fill in the blank question stated as a whole sentence question five electronic switching circuits that decide whether inputs will pass to output or be stopped are called logic gates question six name two common logic families and those are and that is the CMOS logic and the transistor transistor logic or TTL question seven draw and label the schematic symbol for a JK flip-flop and an attempt at that was made right there on the top middle of the screen and moving on to the matching questions match the following items or terms with the correct definitions and those are matched going through them the AND gates is, provides an output of 1 if all inputs are 1 B the OR gates provides an output of 1 when either input is 1 the NOT gates inverts the polarity of the input signal the not the NAND gates or negative AND or NOT AND gate is the it is a not it is a not AND gate that is the answer the NOR gates I mean problem E NOR gates is a NOT OR gate the the X OR gates is the exclusive OR gate and the X NOR gates is the exclusive NOR gate And very quickly to go over an interesting sidebar for the chapter before we close with this chapter chapter 20 very interesting chapter on uh, the different digital circuit uh, concepts and technology the computer computerized tomography or CT many people know that they have taken a CT scan but they hardly know for one they don't know what it means they don't know what it stands for the CT and two much less do they know how it works but here it is computerized tomography CT is a diagnostic medical procedure that uses photo multiplier tubes or PMTs computer scans and x-rays to produce digitized images of the body the technique is also called computed tomography or computerized axial tomography or CAT the term CAT scan is still used today even though it is technically incorrect let's look at the basic principle of CT scanning an x-ray source is mounted opposite an array of PMTs PMT is a sensitive vacuum tube that converts very weak light signals into measurable electric current. The PMT uses a photocathode that gives off electrons, electrons when light strikes it. These electrons then strike the first 
of a series of plates called di dynodes. The dynodes carry a high voltage charge that attracts the stream of electrons. As the electrons bounce from plate to plate, they knock an increasing number of electrons from each plate. Millions of electrons may leave the tube for every electron given off by the photocathode. The tube is thus or the tube thus multiplies the effect of the light that strikes it and enables the brightness of the light to be measured with extreme accuracy. This produces or this procedure continues until the anode grid receives all of the electrons. The electrons are then turned into a digital signal. The digital signal is stored in computer memory and then displayed graphically. Imaging systems can produce three-dimensional images at resolutions four times higher than normal television. During the CT procedure, the patient lies on a table that passes through a circular scanning machine called a gantry. The table is positioned so that the area to be scanned lies in the center of the gantry. A tube on the gantry beams or a tube on the gantry beams x-rays through the patient's body and into the photomultiplier tubes. The gantry rotates around the patient to obtain images from different angles. A computer processes the information to produce a cross-sectional image. Scans of the same organ or even the entire body are obtained by moving the table in the gantry. CT scans are used to diagnose many conditions including tumors, infections, and blood clots. CT also assign or assists in treating some conditions that might otherwise require surgery. For example, doctors can use a CT scan to guide small tubes onto an abscess in the body to drain the infected area. Sometimes a contrast agent is injected into the body to make certain organs show up more clearly. For instance, to outline the inner surfaces of the stomach and bowel, the patient is given a barium mixture to drink. The biggest advantage of the CT over conventional x-ray machines is that the patient is exposed to little radiation. CT scans can be saved as electronic files or even transmitted over modern lines to other doctors for consultation. Chapter 21 Oscillators. The objectives for the chapter are to explain what occurs during an oscillation cycle, identify various oscillators discuss and compare the Armstrong oscillator and the Hartley oscillator and finally to outline the operation of the crystal oscillator and the power oscillator. Some keywords encountered in the chapter are Armstrong oscillator, Colpitz oscillator, crystal controlled oscillator, crystal oven, cycle, gang capacitor, Hartley oscillator, an oscillator, period, Pierce oscillator, piezoelectric effect, the positive feedback, power oscillator, regenerative feedback, series fed oscillator, shunt fed oscillator, and signal generator. These words are in alphabetical order. They're not necessarily in the order that they appear in the chapter, so look for them carefully and do practice and learn their descriptions of their um, definitions. The pendulum on a grandfather's clock swings back and forth to keep time. It marks the time in seconds. The main spring that moves the pendulum is wound with a key. As the spring unwinds, the pendulum swings. 
How does the pendulum keep the correct time? Well, adjustments are made to the pendulum length, so the time required for one complete swing matches one second exactly. The swinging pendulum can be thought of as an oscillator, shown in figure 21-1. An oscillator is an electronic circuit that generates an AC signal at a desired frequency. An oscillator circuit is usually made up of a wave of a wave producing circuit, amplifier and feedback circuit. Variations in oscillator design are usually found in the feedback circuit. An oscillator is essential in many electronic applications. The oscillator is the very heart of radio transmission, microwave communication, radar and much more. Twenty one dot one basic oscillators. An oscillating current is one that flows back and forth. It moves first in one direction and then in the other. You can compare the oscillator circuit output to a typical AC sine wave. The oscillator circuit changes DC from a power supply into input into an AC waveform. Again, the oscillator circuit changes DC from a power supply input into an AC waveform. Very similar to what an inverter, a solar energy inverter does. The AC waveform maintains a steady frequency using a feedback circuit. Again, the AC waveform maintains a steady frequency using a feedback circuit. Very important concept. Follow the voltage amplitude in figure 21-1. Again, follow the voltage amplitude in this figure on the screen. It starts from its reference line and rises to its peak in one direction and then falls to zero. Then it rises to its peak in the opposite direction and then and returns to zero. One cycle, a complete set of events in a repeated series, has been completed. An oscillation, or as oscillation continues, it repeats this cycle. The time that passes during one cycle is called the period of the cycle. The number of cycles occurring per second is measured and given as the frequency in Hertz. We learned earlier that the electricity used in homes and factories is an alternating or oscillating current. In the US it alternates at a frequency of 60 Hertz. The current is generated by dynamos driven by steam, water, or atomic power. In our studies of electronics, voltages and currents of much higher frequencies are used. These are generated with semiconductor devices used as oscillators. These devices do not actually oscillate, but they act as valves. These valves feed energy to tuned circuits to maintain the oscillation. The basic block diagram of an oscillator is shown in figure 21-2. Two conditions must exist to sustain oscillation in a tuned circuit. First, the energy fed back to the tuned circuit must be in phase with the first voltage. The oscillator depends upon this regenerative feedback or positive feedback. There must be enough feedback voltage amplitude to replace the energy lost by circuit resistance. That is the second condition. In chapter 15, the tank circuit was discussed. This would be a good time to review chapter 16, especially the tank circuit. The principles of the tank circuit operation are an essential part of the timing and feedback portion of many oscillator circuits. Armstrong oscillators. An Armstrong oscillator is shown in figure 21-3. From this circuit, the basic theory of oscillators can be explained. Notice the tuned tank circuit L1, C1. This determines the frequency of the oscillator. 
follow the sequence of events in this circuit. Step 1. Examine figure 21-4. When the voltage is applied to the circuit, current flows from B negative through the transistor and coil L2 to B positive. L2 is sometimes called a tickler coil because it provides feedback to L1. L2 is closely coupled to L1. The expanding magnetic field of L2 makes the base end of L1 positive. C1 charges to the polarity shown. The base of Q1 also collects electrons. It charges C2 in the polarity shown. Step 2, examine figure 21-5. When Q1 reaches its saturation point, there is no longer a change of current in L2. Magnetic coupling to L1 drops to zero. The negative charge on the base side of C2 is no longer opposed by the induced voltage of L1. The negative charge drives the transistor to cut off. This rapid decrease in current through the transistor and L2 causes the base end of L1 to become negative. This increases the negative bias on Q1. C1 discharges through L1 as the first half cycle of oscillation. C2 bleeds off its charge through R1. In step 3, the transistor Q1 is held at cutoff until the transistor Q1 is held at cutoff. Again, to repeat step 3, the transistor at Q1 is held at cutoff until the transistor Q1 is held at cutoff until the charge on C2 is bled off to above cutoff. At that time, the transistor starts conduction and the cycle is repeated. There are a few points to remember in Armstrong oscillator operation. One, the voltage developed across L1 first opposes and then adds to the bias developed by the R1C2 combination. The energy added to the tuned tank circuit L1C1 by the tickler coil L2 is great enough to offset the energy lost in the circuit due to resistance. The coupling between L1 and L2 can be adjusted. The combination R1C2 has a somewhat long time constant. It sets the operating bias for the transistor Q1. Again, it sets the operating bias for the transistor. Q1 is operated class C. Study the voltage waveform on the base of Q1 in figure 21-6. The shaded portion is transistor conduction at point B, the bias is negative. This results from the charge on from the charge on C2 plus the induced voltage across L1. The interval from B2 to C denotes the time that passes while C2 discharges through R to the cutoff point, and conduction begins for the next cycle. <coughs> Hartley Oscillators An oscillator used commonly in radio receivers and transmitters is the Hartley Oscillator. It is more stable than the Armstrong, but the theory of its operation is similar. The Hartley Oscillator is set apart from other oscillators by the tapped coil L1 and L2. That is shown in figure 21-7. The Hartley parts in figure 21-7 are labeled in a manner similar to the labeling used 
in the for the Armstrong oscillator in figures 21-4 and 21-5 from before. The L1 section of the coil is in series with the emitter collector circuit. It carries the total collector current. The current IE, which includes IC, is shown by the arrows. When the circuit is to turned on, current flows through L1. It induces a voltage on L2. The voltage induced on L2 makes the base of Q more positive and drives the transistor to saturation. Once the transistor is driven to saturation, the current causes or the current ceases flowing. The magnetic coupling between coils L1 and L2 collapses to zero. The less positive voltage at the base of Q causes the transistor to decrease conduction. This decrease induces a negative voltage at the top of L2 or at the top end of L2 which is reverse bias for the transistor. The transistor is quickly driven to cut off and the cycle is then repeated. The tank circuit is oscillating which causes the transistors to switch between saturation and cutoff. The switch in action of the transistor is the frequency of the oscillator. The resting bias condition of the transistor is set by resistors RB and RE. The radio frequency choke RFC in the figure blocks the RF signal from the power source. In this circuit, note that coil L1, coil L1 is in series with the transistor collector circuit. It is a series-fed oscillator. In Figure 21-8 on the screen now, a shunt-fed oscillator is shown. The operation is the same. Note that the DC path for the emitter collector current is not through coil L1. The AC signal path, however, is through C and L1. At point A, the two current the two current components are separated and required to take parallel paths. Both oscillators receive their feedback energy through magnetic coupling. Jumping on to the review questions for section 21.11. What is the purpose of an oscillator? It is to get an AC waveform from a DC signal. Two, the time that passes during one cycle of an oscillating current is called the resting bias of the cycle. Three, what two conditions must exist to sustain an oscillation in a tuned circuit? And that is a regenerative feedback and enough feedback voltage amplitude. For the Armstrong oscillator has a tickler coil. Five, the Hartley oscillator has a tapped coil. And six, the purpose of the tickler coil is to provide induced voltage to the tank circuit. 21.2 other oscillators there are quite a number of other types of oscillators you will encounter in the study of electronics the following section discusses the culpits oscillator the crystal controlled oscillators the power oscillators the operation amplifier oscillators as you study these oscillators you will notice that they're they are similar in many ways to the two common basic oscillators you have just studied the Colpitz oscillator. Feedback can also be created with an electrostatic field such as that found in a capacitor. Replace the tapped coil from the Hartley oscillator with a split stator capacitor. 
a voltage of proper polarity will be fed back causing the circuit to oscillate. This circuit is called a Culpitz oscillator. Again, feedback can also be created with an electrostatic field such as that found in a capacitor. Replace the tapped coil from the Hartley oscillator with a split stator capacitor. A voltage of proper polarity will be fed back causing the circuit to oscillate. That is what is that is what is a Culpitz oscillator shown on the screen right now. The operation of this oscillator is like that of the Hartley oscillator. However, the signal is coupled back to C1 of the tank circuit through coupling capacitor C3. A changing voltage at the collector appears as a voltage across the tank circuit L C1 C2. The tank circuit must be in the proper phase with the transistor circuit to be a re regenerative signal. The amount of feedback will depend on the ratio of C1 to C2. This ratio is most often fixed. Both capacitors C1 and C2 are controlled by a single shaft called a ganged capacitor. The frequency of the oscillator is set in the common manner. The tuned tank consists of L and C1 and C2 in series. The circuit is shunt fed. The series fed is not possible due to the blocking of DC by the capacitors. Crystal controlled oscillators. A circuit with a stable with a stable high frequency is the crystal controlled oscillator. It is used in radio communications, broadcasting stations, and in equipment requiring a fixed frequency with little drift. You learned earlier that an EMF can be made with mechanical pressure and or distortion of certain crystalline substances. substances. The opposite is also true. A voltage applied to the surface of a crystal will cause distortion in the crystal. These effects are called piezoelectric effects. When electrical pressure is applied to a crystal, it will oscillate. The frequency of oscillation depends on the size, thickness, and kind of crystal used. Looking at figure on the screen 21-10, the crystal is precisely cut and mounted on two connection leads using conductive using conductive cement. The entire crystal is then enclosed in a metallic can that is filled with dry nitrogen gas. In figure 21-11 top, there is a circuit made of electrical components that is equivalent to a crystal. A crystal is placed between two metallic holders. This forms a capacitor CH. The crystal itself is the dielectric. CG denotes the series capacitance between the metal holding plates and the air gap between them as a dielectric. L, C, and R denote the traits of the crystal. Note the lightness or note the likeness of the equivalent crystal circuit to a tuned circuit. Both a tuned circuit and a crystal will have a resonant frequency. Crystals are used in amateur radio and commercial broadcasting stations to control the transmitter frequency. The frequency generated by the crystal is susceptible to temperature changes. In a commercial broadcasting station, crystals used to control transmitter frequency are, pla are placed in crystal ovens. The crystal oven maintains a constant temperature, which will turn, which will in turn stabilize the frequency produced by the crystal. A crystal oscillator circuit is shown in figure 21-12. Compare this circuit to figure 21-8. It is the same circuit with the crystal added 
to the feedback circuit. The crystal acts as a series resonant circuit. It sets the frequency of the feedback currents. The tank circuit must be tuned to this frequency. Additional uses for crystals. A crystal changing frequency because of a change in temperature is undesirable. Again, a crystal changing its frequency because of the change of temperature is undesirable in an oscillator circuit. However, this trait can be used to our advantage as well. The frequency developed by a quartz crystal varies in direct proportion to the temperature to which it is exposed. Figure 21-14 shows a simple circuit for measuring temperature. Two crystals are used. The crystal is used as a reference, or one crystal is used as a reference, and the other crystal is exposed to the temperature being measured. The crystals will produce two different frequencies, which are input to different or to differential counter. Again, the crystals will produce will produce two different frequencies, which are input to the different differential counter. The differential counter is a digital integrated circuit. The two frequencies are compared and then can be displayed on a number of different devices, such as an analog meter, digital meter, LED display, etc. Accuracy of this system can be up to plus or minus 0 0.001 Kelvin. Quartz Quartz crystals are also used in timing devices because of their ability and accuracy. A signal generator is an electronic oscillator that generates various signals for testing. Power oscillators. The figure on the screen shows a power oscillator circuit. This schematic is of a push-pull oscillator. The collector load of each transistor is the primary of the transformer. The AC output is found at the secondary. A proper turn ratio is used if higher or lower voltages are needed. A slight imbalance in conductivity between Q1 and Q2 will start oscillation. This imbalance is always present due to variances in transistor characteristics or temperature. This will send one of the transistors toward saturation and the other toward cutoff. Assume Q1 starts conducting the voltage at C or, or at C of Q1 goes less positive. This makes the base of Q2 less positive. Q2 drives toward cutoff a more positive voltage at C of Q2 drives the Q1 base more positive. Q1 reaches saturation. When there is no change in current at saturation, transformer primary reactance drops to zero. Collector voltage toward the value of VCC also increases. This more positive voltage coupled to the base of Q2 through R1 starts Q2 toward conduction and saturation. The transistors conduct one at a time. The output is combined into a complete cycle at the transformer secondary output. The output from the transformer in figure 21-16 is connected to a rectifier and some filter circuits the output again becomes DC. Operational Amplifier os Oscillator Circuits The Operational Amplifier, review chapter 19 if needed, can be used in many oscillator circuits in place of a transistor in such circuits as the Hartley or Colpitts oscillator. See figure 21-7 excuse me, 21-17 on the screen now. Notice that the crystal is used in the feedback circuit of the op-amp. 
the charging circuit R1, R2, and the capacitor determine the amount of feedback and wave shaping. The NAND gate is used to start the output from the op amp. Without it, the circuit would need some exterior input to start the circuit. Another oscillator that can utilize the op amp is the Wyan bridge oscillator. See figure 21-18. This circuit operates using both positive and negative feedback. The negative and positive feedback circuits must be balanced for the oscillator to work properly. The balancing is achieved by inserting the tungsten filament lamp in the circuit as part of the feedback, feedback system. The resistance of the lamp varies with the amount of current in the lamp filament. As current increases, temperature of the filament increases and so too the resistance value of the filament. The inverse is also true. As current decreases, temperature decreases and in turn the resistance value of the filament also decreases. This principle is the secret to balancing the amount of feedback in the circuit. Many types of oscillators are formed on a single linear integrated chip. Only a few extra components are needed to produce a working oscillator. Some are voltage controlled oscillators or VOs, VCOs. Figure 21-19 shows that the frequency output of the oscillator in this direct proportion or is in direct proportion to the voltage level level applied to one of the VCO pins. Again the frequency output of the oscillator is in direct proportion to the voltage level applied to one of the VCO pins. Moving on to the review questions for section 21.2. Number one, why is series feeding impossible in a coppets, that is, in a coppets oscillator? That is due to the blocking of DC by the capacitors. Question two, what is the piezoelectric effect or piezoelectric effect? And that is oscillation by a crystal through applying voltage to the crystal and causing it to vibrate at a steady rate or oscillation. Question three. This is fill in the blank. A Pierce oscillator uses a crystal in place of the tuned circuit found in a Colpitz oscillator. And finally, question four, draw the circuit or show the circuit for a power oscillator that is shown on the screen. And finally, this summary for the chapter, all important chapter on oscillators. An oscillator is an electronic circuit that produces an AC signal at a desired frequency. A cycle is a complete set of events in a repeated series for, a AC, for an AC signal. Frequency is the number of cycles per second. It is measured in hertz. An oscillator circuit is usually made up of a wave producing circuit, amplifier, and feedback circuit. The feedback circuit usually causes variations in oscillator designs. The Armstrong oscillator has a tickler coil for feedback. The Hartley oscillator has a tapped coil in the tank circuit. The Coppitz oscillator has two capacitors in the tank circuit with a tap between them. Crystal oscillators use the piezoelectric effect in crystals to maintain accurate frequencies. Crystal oscillator circuits can be used for timing devices and temperature recording. And finally, the operation amplifiers can be configured similarly to other oscillator circuits, taking the place of the transistor in most cases. Moving on to the test your knowledge questions for the chapter. Fill in the blank. A cycle is a complete set of events repeated in a repeated series for an AC signal. 
to what is the period of a cycle and that is the time that it pa that passes during a cycle three the tuned tank circuit this is a fill in the blank the tuned tank circuit determines the frequency of the Armstrong oscillator four outline the steps in the operation of the Armstrong oscillator step one is when the voltage is applied to the circuit current flows from B negative through the transistor and coil L2 to B positive L1 is sometimes called a tickler coil because it provides feedback to L1 excuse me L2 is sometimes called a tickler coil because it provides feedback to L1 L2 is closely coupled to L1 the expanding magnetic field of L2 makes the base of L1 positive C1 changes to the polarity shown. The base of Q1 also collects electrons. It charges C2 in the polarity shown. Step 2. This is from figure 21-5. When Q1 reaches its saturation point, there is no longer a change of current in L2. Magnetic coupling of L1 drops to zero. The negative charge on the base of C2 is no longer opposed by the induced voltage of L1. The negative charge drives the transistor to cut off. This rapid decrease in current through the transistor and L2 causes the base end of L1 to become negative. This increases the negative bias of Q1. C1 discharges through L1 as the first half of the cycle of oscillation. C2 bleeds off its charge through R1. Step 3. The transistor Q1 is held at cutoff until the transistor Q1 is held at cutoff until the charge of C2 is bled off to the above to above cutoff. At that time the transistor starts conduction and the cycle is repeated. Question number five. What feedback method is used in the Hartley oscillator magnetic coupling? The answer is magnetic coupling. Question six. What feedback method is used in the Culpitz oscillator? That is an electrostatic field with a capacitor. Number seven, draw the equivalent electrical circuits of a crystal and an attempt at that is made at the bottom right of the screen. Question 8. With three types of electronic applications, can crystal can the crystal oscillator circuit be used for? And that is for digital thermometers, signal operator or signal generators, and timing devices. And for an interesting sidebar in the chapter on oscillators, this sidebar is about radio detection and ranging or radar. The first major contribution to the development of radar dates back to the 16 to the 1860s by James C. Maxwell, who predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves that travel at the speed of light. He also proposed the possibility of generating this type of wave. In the late 1880s, Heinrich Hertz proved Maxwell's ideas correct by producing radio waves and demonstrating that such electromagnetic waves could be reflected from solid objects. Advances in radar technology continued through the early 1900s, but the growing threat of war of the in the 1930s stimulated efforts to improve radar technology. A change of radar stations were built along the England's east and south coasts before World War II began. And by 1940 the U.S. was producing pulse-type radar for tracking planes and controlling anti-aircraft guns. The radar units operated on, a, on the simple principle that microwaves directed toward an object will reflect 
of the object and back to the transmitter. The amount of time it takes the wave to travel to and from the object is in direct proportion to the distance the object is from the transmitter. Although radar sets differ in size, most have similar parts, including an oscillator, modulator, transmitter, duplexer, an antenna, receiver, signal processor, display, and a timer. The oscillator circuit of the radar unit produces microwaves. Microwaves are very short electromagnetic waves with frequencies of 1 gigahertz or higher. Like beams of light, microwaves are easily manipulated in terms of width and direction, and they will reflect off different materials. The intensity of the reflected waves depend or depends on the type of material it strikes. A microwave is transmitted out of the radar dish with, in short, uh, but very high energy pulses. When the waves or when the wave strikes a reflective material like the metallic skin of a helicopter, the wave is reflected in all directions. Some of the wave is reflected back to the radar dish. The original radar units plotted only the distance of an object using an oscilloscope. Today's radar units can measure the angle of the object in relation to the radar unit itself as well as its distance. A servo unit mounted in the base and arm of the radar unit can be used to detect or can be used to determine the exact elevation angle of the object and the angle of rotation of the radar dish when the echo returns. This information is fed into a computer and displayed on a screen showing the relative distance and altitude of the object. The strength of the reflected echo can also help identify the type of aircraft being tracked. The most common type of radar is pulsar radar. Pulsar radar emits signals in powerful bursts that last only a few millions of a second. Continuous wave radar sends, a, sends out a continuous signal rather than short bursts. Doppler and frequency modulator or FM radar are both continuous wave radar. Doppler radar operates on the basis of the Doppler effect and is used chiefly to make precise speed measurements. FM radar transmits a continuous wave while rapidly increasing or decreasing the frequency of the signal at regular intervals. As a result, FM radar can determine the distance to a moving or stationary object. One of the first countermeasures devised for eluding radar detection was the dropping of chaff, long thin strips of aluminum foil. When, when, when dropped from a plane, chaff drifts through the air and circulates on the turbulence created by the aircraft. Each strip reflects radar signals and causes difficulty in recognizing echoes from the real planes. Other countermeasures include the use of high-powered radio transmitters to produce interference and the use of equipment that can modify pulses before they are returned. The U.S. Air Force has also designed two planes, the Stealth Bomber and the Stealth Fighter, that are almost invisible to radar. And that concludes this very complete and thorough set of chapters, chapters 19, which is integrated circuits, chapter 20, which is digital circuits, and chapter 21, which is, of course, oscillators. Congratulations, you have completed these chapters after you're finished, the chapter reviews, quizzes, tests, and experiments and you have understood all the concepts within this chapter, so you will have earned this electronics course rank of 05, Lieutenant Colonel. Congratulations again.